your hands and praise the Lord. Celebrating the Lord with us today. It's always a blessing to be in God's house one more time. Uh, if you don't mind turning with me to the scripture, 16th chapter of the gospel according to Mark, Mark 16, verses 14 through 20. Mark 16, verses 14 through 20. And please, please uh, continue to keep all of our families lifted up in prayer. And we also ask that you would keep lifted up in prayer the family of Sister uh, Shonda Campbell, LaShonda Campbell Jackson, uh, at Johnson, excuse me, LaShonda Campbell Johnson, as uh, her mother-in-law passed. And her service is going to be, I believe, uh, tomorrow in Jackson, Michigan. So please reach out to Shonda uh, if you can and just let her know that your prayers are with her and her family as they deal with this loss. Amen? Amen. Amen. But we know in spite of all that goes on, we do know that God is still in control. And we praise, praise, praise the Lord and we celebrate the goodness of God. 15th chapter, 16th chapter of Mark, verses 14 through 20. When you got it, say amen. amen. Still looking, say I'm on the way. All right, I guess nobody said I'm on the way. We're all there. Um, we find these words as Jesus appears to the disciples yet again uh, after his resurrection. Bible says, still later he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be able to be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them and he was taken up into heaven and set down at the place of honor at God's right hand and the disciples went everywhere he preached, everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Um, for a few moments today as we celebrate the goodness of God, I ask that you would consider this one word, and the word for today is lead. Today's word is lead. Just look at your neighbor, if you don't mind, and say lead. Um, and while I'm thinking about it, in the text, uh, Jesus said that we will be able to cast out demons in his name. Please come join us in Bible study this week at noon and at 7 p.m. We've been dealing with uh, the topic, basically, what does the Bible say about blank? Last week, we talked about what does the Bible say about race, oppression, and liberation? This week, we're going to do what does the Bible say about uh, mental illness and depression and the church's response, the church's role. As you know, for years uh, as a church, the church has not always been proactive in dealing with persons that, that with mental illness and persons with um, any sort of depression or any sort of issues like that. So we're going to talk about the various factors regarding that this Tuesday at noon and 7. Anyone with a background in this that would love to come out and speak with us and dialogue with us, please do. Medical professionals, social workers, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, anyone that's got a field of um, expertise in that field, please come be with us Tuesday at noon and 7. Part three of the series, Our Hope for This Year, and we're talking today about the word lead. It's a new year now. You can't miss it. 2015 is here. Uh, are y'all still writing 2014 when y'all write sometimes, though? Sometimes. I, I slip up and do it sometimes. I'm not going to lie. I still write 14, but it's 2015 now. Uh, it's a new year, and, and, and we're dealing with now where we started the year with resolutions. Now we're starting to see if the resolutions really are making it. Matter of fact, who in here, if you don't mind raising your hand, you don't have to, but if you don't mind, who in here has already broken one of your resolutions for this year? If you don't mind raising your hand, I have as well, amen. Anybody, you've already broken something. You started a resolution, you say, you know what, I broke it. And, and that's okay, because that's what happens from time to time, and we make resolutions because we want to be better. We make resolutions because we want to do things differently. We want this to be best year ever. And the same thing that individuals do, I think churches do as well, but our resolutions aren't as much shouldn't be as much as a resolution, but should be more of a directive, more of a goal, more of something that we're not just saying we're going to do, but something that we're actually, uh, really, it, it is a resolution. We're resolving ourselves, making up our minds to do it. So we begin this year with the understanding that we have a hope for this new year. And we started with the hope of this new year with the word encouragement. We talked about how to encourage each other in the church. Church folk need to be encouraged too. 
Before we go out and encourage the world, we have to, first of all, encourage each other. Charity begins where? At home. So you got to encourage. So we talked the first week about encouraging each other. Looking at Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, we learn we've got to encourage each other in church through motivation, uh, through hope, through motivation, and through genuine, honest fellowship. Then we moved on the next week to those, uh, once we've encouraged those that were already in church, we talked the next week about how to go out and find. Y'all remember that? We looked at Matthew 13, 1 through 8, and 18 through 23, and we, Jesus taught us who we're going to find when we go out. We're going to find those that are unchurched. They're not going to church at all. We're going to find those that are playing church, those that go to church but go for the wrong reason, and we're going to find those that are de-churched, and the de-churched are the ones that are done with church, period, just been all churched out. So we've dealt with how to encourage. We've dealt with what to do and, and how to go out and find. And the thing is, once we find the people, what do we do with them? Well, once we find them, it's time now that we understand and learn how we can lead. Uh, we are compelled. We are called. We are committed to be leaders for Christ Jesus. One of the things we get confused about in church um, and, and, and I've been dealing with this and wrestling with this my whole ministry, and I praise God that it is 2015, and um, thinking about it the other day, it, it marks 20 years of doing this for me. I've been doing this for 20 years now, and in the 20 years I've been doing this, I've noticed one of the things we like to do is we like to be very loose with the word leadership. Um, so people in church will tell you, well, Reverend, I'm not an officer, so I'm not a leader in the church. I, I don't have a position, so I'm not a leader in the church. And what I've come to find out over these 20 years of doing this is that everybody who comes to church is a leader in the church. The simple fact that you've come here makes you a leader. You cannot escape it. You cannot avoid it. You can't run away from it. You are a leader. Even if you don't want to be a leader, guess what? You're a leader. You're a leader because you're here today. You're a leader because you could have stayed home today and done something else. You could have said, you know what, it's supposed to snow, and I don't want to get out there and get caught in the snow. You could have been uh, at home saying, I'm going to sit here and just watch TV or whatever I'm going to do. But you are here, and the fact that you are here makes you a leader. And because we're leaders for Jesus Christ, it's our imperative to understand how Jesus wants us to lead. So in the scripture, Jesus opens up to us in Mark's account of the Great Commissioning, final instructions Jesus gives to his disciples about what he wants them to do. He appears to his disciples after his resurrection, and he rebukes them first for their stubborn unbelief. Jesus says, look, y'all, you've been with me this long, and you still doubt me. I told you I was coming back. I came back. I appeared to some people. They came and told you about it. You ain't believe them. So now here I am rebuking you for your unbelief. And then Jesus went on and, and, and began to tell them how to lead. I'm not going to stay here long, but I have to say this. Um, sometimes we have to understand, even if we don't know how God's going to do it, if God said he's going to do it, it's already done. Say that one more time a little slower so we'll understand it. Even if we don't know how God's going to do it. Even if we cannot rationalize it, even if we cannot uh, make it empirical, even if we cannot find a formulaic way that we think it can be done in our minds, if God said he's going to do it, then you can count it as already done. So when Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to come back, he had already let them know it's done. But they didn't believe it until they saw it for themselves. So Jesus got on them a little bit, but then he went on to say, all right, I'm going to tell you how to lead. He says, all right, here's what I want you to do. Go into the world and preach the good news. Preach my good news to everyone. Anyone who believes will be baptized, will be saved, and those who don't believe will be condemned, period. Plain and simply put, you believe, you'll be saved. You don't, you'll be condemned. Jesus went on to say, and those that believe in me will have miraculous signs follow them. Uh, as they move throughout, they will be able to cast out demons in my name. They'll be able to speak in new languages. They will be able to handle poisonous snakes. And even if the snakes bite them, they still won't be able to be affected because the poison will do nothing to them. Then he went on to say, and they'll be able to place their hands on the sick, on the affirmed, on, on the infirmed, on the afflicted, and they will be healed. And then Jesus, the Bible said, was taken up right in front of the disciples, ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God. And the disciples went everywhere after this point, preaching and doing what Jesus told them to do. And the Bible said the Lord worked through them and everything that Jesus said came to pass because he did what he said he would do. 
we've learned how to encourage each other, and we really do have to encourage one another. We, we've learned how to go out and find. We're all evangelists. Everybody's supposed to go out and find. And once we find them, question is now, how do we lead them? Uh, it's an old joke, old preacher definition of, of leadership. My dad told me a long time ago, it's funny, preachers say this to each other all the time, said the way uh, how you define leadership is this. Basically, you find out which direction the people are going, you jump out in front of them and act like it was your idea. Come on, somebody. Many of us know we've led in just that way before. We found out which way the crowd was already moving. We got up front and we said, this was my idea. I'm the leader. Amen. But that's not the kind of leadership God wants us to have as his children. God wants us to be leaders, and Jesus tells us exactly how to be leaders. And for a few moments today, we're going to go into uh, and, and understand and dive right into the three things that Jesus teaches us about our leadership. First thing is this. Jesus teaches us that we lead by what we say. Um, if you don't mind, just look at your neighbor if you would. I know y'all get sick of doing this, but do it just, just to amuse me if you don't mind. Amen. Just look at your neighbor if you would and say, uh, your words matter. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't mind, look at your other neighbor on the other side. It's not going to kill you, I promise. Hadn't killed you yet. Amen. Other neighbor on the other side and say to them, uh, your words matter. The first way we lead is basically based upon what we say. People determine who we are and who we aren't, oftentimes simply by listening to what we say. How we talk, our ability to speak, our ability to motivate with words, our ability to know what we're talking about. One of the things is when you go to talk to people about the word of God, you got to know what you're talking about. Because what we say determines how we lead. My father was in school with, uh, with, with Dr. King, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And they were in school together. Dr. King was working on his PhD. My dad was working on his Master's of Divinity. And at the time, uh, I, when I found this out, I was so excited. And I asked my dad, you know, Selma's out now, and we just celebrated Dr. King's birthday. When I was a kid and I found out my dad went to school with Dr. King, I asked my dad, I said, man, what made Dr. King so great? What made him such a great man? Wow, this was awesome. My dad said he was in the right place at the right time and wasn't afraid to speak up. And it didn't hurt that he could say it. How we're able to motivate people with words, it, it means a lot and, and determines a lot of, of how far our leadership is able to go because of what we're able to say. So for a better understanding, look at the text with me for a minute. Jesus comes back to his disciples. After his resurrection, he finds them eating together. And as they're eating together, they're fellowshipping. Didn't we talk about fellowship in the first week? They're encouraging each other. They're motivating each other. They're fellowshipping with each other. Jesus comes back and gets on them a little bit for their lack of faith. Um, I have to preach this to myself as well, and I'm not staying here long. This is really not germane to the subject per se today, but I have to say it. Have some faith. Um, I, I, I know my faith wavers from time to time. It is not always where it should be. Have some faith in God. And, and one of the things I think that disappoints God more than anything else um, is the same thing <clears throat> that disappoints parents with their children. When your children don't believe you when you say you're going to do something, isn't that disappointing? If you tell your child you're going to do something and your child has to come, come back asking you 5, 10, 15 times are you going to do it, don't y'all get offended? Well, how do you think, or, or grandchildren or, or anybody, how do you think God feels when God tells us he's going to do something, yet our faith does not hold up to that which God said God would do? Because we just don't believe God will do it. God, disappointed in the disciples, but still loved them, said to them, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm going to rebuke you because your faith is not where it should be. Then he still teaches them about leadership. Let me just stop here for a minute and say this too. Even those with weak or not perfect faith, even those with weak and imperfect faith are still leaders in God's kingdom. It is not perfection that makes us leaders in God's kingdom, but it's the ability to know and to understand that what we have to say about Jesus matters. So Jesus tells the disciples, here's how you lead. First and foremost, you're going to lead based on what you're able to say and say about me. He says, go into the world and preach the good news to everyone. Jesus says, use your words to preach the good news. Use your words. Don't y'all say that to little kids. Use your words 
to go use your words to preach the good news and use your words to lead on my behalf. Brothers and sisters, God has blessed us to go out and find, but once we find, we've got to be able to lead. And the leadership begins with what we say. Before people know anything about you, before people know who you are, before people know what you are, before people know uh, whatever, anything about you, they're going to understand who you are based on what you've said. Before they meet you face to face, they're going to uh, know who you are based on what you've been able to talk about. In fact, there's some people that we know that we just don't deal with because we know before we deal with them, they ain't talking about nothing. Let's be real for a minute, church. Come on, y'all can, can be real for a minute. I took my tie off now. It's real time. Amen. So do you know anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. Just nod with me in affirmation or our spirits will agree. Amen. Do you know anybody in your life that you know you just don't talk to no more because they ain't talking about nothing? Moment you get on the phone with them, oh, here they go. They ain't going to talk about nothing today. They ain't talking about a thing that's relevant. So you already know this person is not going to lead you anywhere because they're not talking about anything to begin with. Talking about the same old stuff. Been talking about the same old stuff. Telling the same old stories. Same old lies. Come on, somebody. For the past 20, 30, 40 years, you already know their leadership is done because of what they're talking about. Then, uh, I, I, I'm sad to say, there's some folk that don't want to deal with us. Because oftentimes, you know, we've, we've, we've had the James Brown syndrome, like a dull knife just ain't cutting, talking loud, saying nothing. Come on, y'all. So they don't want to deal with us. And that's why when Jesus says to the disciples, go out and preach my good news, he's telling them your words do matter. But here's what really blows my mind. Jesus says to the disciples, go out and preach my good news. The disciples did not have microphones. The disciples did not have pulpits. The disciples did not have ordination papers. The disciples did not have a license given by a presiding elder at the hand of a bishop at, at, the, at the quarterly conference. The disciples did not have, as a matter of fact, he wasn't just talking to the disciples, he was talking to the whole world. Everybody who loves and believes in Jesus ought be a preacher. Not just the one with the mic in the hand. Your not having a mic does not absolve you from what you got to do for Jesus. So everybody has to have a voice, has to have words, has to speak about how good God is to them. And that's how you lead. And let me tell you something. Jesus told them, go out and preach my good news. And those who hear you and believe will be saved. Those who don't will be condemned. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be articulate. You don't have to have your subject and verb agree. You don't have to know the meaning of every single word. But if you go out and tell somebody that you were sick and now you're well, if you you go out and tell somebody you were blind but now you see if you go out and tell somebody I was lost but now I'm found if you go out and tell somebody I was broke but now I'm rich and you let them know it was Jesus who made me well Jesus who made me rich Jesus who made me see you don't have to be articulate you don't have to be eloquent you don't have to have all the greatest words if you just let folk know the good news and the good news today is I woke up this morning in my right mind good news today is I woke up this morning and got out to bed when I could not really get out to bed last week that's the good news good news is God allowed me to make it here to celebrate his name and I'm gonna make my words matter today and preach his good news are you going out leading by your words and letting people know the good news of Christ Jesus we lead by what we say second thing God teaches us today through Jesus Christ we lead by what we do um, and, and, and it's not so much what you say, are you able to back up the things you say with your actions? We've all known people before in our lives, talk a good game, but don't do nothing. Talk a good game, but got no follow through. Nothing worse in the world. The devil must be mad at this point. The microphone pops at, at, at this point at both services. Amen. Devil must be upset. Um, <laughs> People, it did pop, I think about the same time. People um, want to see you not just be able to speak words. They want to see actions to back up words. Doing this for 20 years now, amen, 10 of them here, 11, almost 11 of them here in the 11th year here doing this. I met a lot of people who talked a good game and couldn't back it up. Come on now, church, let's be real. Ladies, y'all ever met a real suave man who tried to get you with some game? Come on now. I'll tell you here. Tell you here, give you the moon and give you the stars. 
Mm, Negro living with his mama. Come on, somebody. Help me out, church. <laughs> whatever you say, whatever you say, you got to be able to back it up with your actions. So my words ought to be reinforced by my actions I cannot be somebody who's just out there talking about a bunch of stuff that I'm not doing. Jesus says this to the disciples. He says, now I've given you the ability to go out and preach my gospel. Now watch what you have to do next. He says, lead by your words. Go preach your good news. Now lead by your actions. Jesus says to the disciples, um, when you tell of my good news and you believe it and others believe it, Jesus says, now I'm going to give you action to back up the words. And he says to the disciples some crazy stuff. He says, miraculous signs will accompany you. Stuff that just won't make sense to anybody else but you will accompany you. And he says things like, you'll be able to cast out demons in my name. And then he says to the disciples, new languages will be spoken by you. Many people who've never been to school, never had education, never been able to be uh, 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 trained formally will have new languages spoken and nobody will know where that came from. Jesus says, poisonous snakes will be handled with safety. And even if the snake somehow gets you with poison, you will not be harmed. And Jesus says, the sick will be healed by your hand. Jesus said to the disciples, when you lead by your words, I will help you lead by action. Brothers and sisters, it's not enough that we lead by words, but we've also got to let actions also follow our words. And I'm glad that the actions that we do are not governed by us, but Jesus himself comes and acts through us as we lead by our actions. Watch what he does. He says, we'll be able to cast out demons in his name. Remember, we're going to talk about this in Bible study a little bit this week about demon, uh, demonizing and, and understanding if, if uh, mental illness is a demon or is it not a demon or what is it or whatever the case may be. But Jesus says here, Jesus says, you will be able to cast out demons in my name. In other words, you may say, well, Reverend, I've never dealt with a demon. I don't even know what a demon looks like. I watch those shows on TV and see the demons with the red eyes and the glowing and all. I ain't never dealt with nobody like that. So why is this applicable to me? It's applicable to you because when I read that Jesus says we'll be able to cast out demons in his name, that means when I act on behalf of Jesus and Jesus acts through me and I lead people by my actions, he lets me know there's nothing that will come my way that can stop me. I wish I had about four folk in here that understood when cast out a demon doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to cast a demon out of somebody. It means that whatever you throw against me, God's already taken care of it. Whatever steps up against me, God's already handled it. Whatever situation I face, God's already moved in it. Then he goes on to say, you will be able to speak in new languages. Well, let me tell you something. I've never been fluent in anything but English. No, a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of French. Only thing I'm fluent in is English. And when God tells me, you're going to speak in new languages, he's not necessarily telling me I'm going to speak a new tongue. He's telling me I'm I might do a new thing and that new thing I might do might be something nobody's ever seen before nobody's ever heard before but when I'm leading by my actions people understand God begins to make ways out of no way but here's my personal favorite God says when you lead by your actions he said I will allow you to handle poisonous snakes and even if the snake bites you nothing's gonna happen to you well I don't have any snakes slithering on the ground but I sure enough know a lot of two-legged snakes is there anybody in here that knows some two-legged snakes with me. Don't you worry about the two-legged snakes on your job, two-legged snakes in your house, two-legged snakes in your church. You just know that whatever somebody spits at you, God won't allow to harm you. The Bible says you'll be able through your actions to lay your hands on the sick and they shall be healed. Never underestimate the healing power that is in Christ Jesus. And what I love so much about God is this. He says, I'm going to guarantee you that the miracles that follow you will always follow you as long as you lead by your actions. Brothers and sisters, we got to start believing there's healing power in the name of Jesus. We got to start believing that there's healing 
miraculous soul saving healing in the name of Jesus. We got to start and many times we shortchange him because when God says I'm, I'm, I'm going to lay your, my hands on others through my actions and they will be healed and we say well Reverend um, I, uh, my, my leg was hurting last week it's still hurting I ain't got my healing. My back was hurting last week back still hurting I ain't got no healing. Head was hurting last week and it's still hurting I ain't got no healing and I think sometimes we shortchange God. Because what I found out about God is this, the healing that God provides and allows us to provide as we lay our hands on others. My physical affliction may never go away, but God does something on my inside that allows me to deal with whatever the world is trying to do to my outside. So while I still may have the physical pain, God has a way of healing in such a manner that what used to bother me just does not bother me anymore. The pain that used to hold me back does not hold me back anymore. And yes, my body may still hurt, but my soul is all right with Jesus. My body might still hurt, but my spirit is all right with Jesus. And he gives us the ability as we lead through our actions to let people know God will make a way. So we lead. We lead by what we say. We lead by what we do. And this one is going to be a hard one for some folk to deal with. We lead by what we say. We lead by what we do. And finally, we lead by who leads us. In other words, I know who you are by who you follow. I can tell what's important to you by knowing who you follow behind. One of the things I'm dealing with now, I talked about it this morning, it puzzles me, it baffles the heck out of me. My family is a family where we've always had little boys. We've had boys, 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 and, and boys and girls are different, let's be real. They're different, they're different. Not, nothing bad, nothing good, nothing, it's, it's just different, they're different. And one thing I've learned is, um, I'm, I was a little boy, so I have a little boy, I understand little boys, little girls can be cruel. Oh, my sweet Lord, they can be cruel. And so Miriam now is, is in the fourth grade. When she's dealing with this, she's dealing now with the separation of, of little girls who are trying to become leaders of cliques, leaders of crews, leaders of posses, and, 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 and they're trying to lead. And because they're leading, they're trying to tell you what you can and cannot do. So they'll tell Miriam or try to tell Miriam, you can't be friends with so-and-so because we don't like so-and-so. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. We don't like so-and-so, so you can't be friends with so-and-so. Making up rumors about other little girls. We don't like so-and-so. We don't like this and that. You can't watch this show because that's a baby show. Can't watch no baby show. And I had to tell Miriam, I said, sweetheart, let me tell you something. You don't follow them. They can do whatever they want to do. Don't ever let somebody, this is me to you, don't ever let somebody determine what your value system is. Don't ever let somebody else determine what's important to you. Don't ever let somebody, I don't care if it's your friend, I don't care if it's mom or dad, I don't care if it's me, whoever it is. Don't let somebody else determine what's important to you. So, in, in saying all of that and doing all of that, I began to think, and I said, man, you know, them fourth grade girls are rough. But then I said, you know what, some 40-year-old Christians are rough too. And 50-year-old Christians are rough. 60-year-old Christians are rough. Because in church, we do the same thing. We don't want to do so-and-so if my friend ain't doing it. I ain't going to sing in the choir because my friend stopped singing in the choir. Come on, church. Nudge your neighbor and say, ooh. I ain't going to serve on this board because my friend stopped serving on the board. I ain't going to do this. I ain't going to do that because my friend don't do this. My friend don't do it. Let me tell you something. You cannot be an effective leader for Jesus when you fall in behind every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Mary, and Sue, and Jane. You got to understand my leadership is, is given to me not because I follow you, but because I follow Jesus. So in the text, the last time, Jesus is telling the disciples. Matter of fact, I can imagine, Derek, Jesus telling the disciples, I'm glad y'all ain't follow each other because if so, I wouldn't have had none of y'all because y'all would have gone the same way as Judas. Come on, somebody. But he says, you lead by what you say. You lead by what you do. And then watch what Jesus does next. He never tells them you're led by who you follow. He says, I can show you better than I can tell you. So after Jesus says what he says, the Bible said he's taken into heaven. And we say it all the time. He ascendeth into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick, that is the living, and the dead. So he goes up into heaven. And the Bible says when he goes up into heaven, the disciples immediately began to follow him. They couldn't follow him up into heaven because it was not their time to be taken up there. There wasn't enough room for all of them up there at that time. They had to establish some things, get some things together. It just was not their time. 
but they followed Jesus on earth. And we know they followed Jesus because they went everywhere Jesus told them to go. They said everything Jesus told them to say. Miracles followed them everywhere Jesus told them they would follow and everything they did was confirmed man when they followed Jesus later on in the book of Acts we see Peter and John come across a crippled beggar and they come across the beggar and they say silver and gold have I not but what I have I'm gonna give to you in the name of Jesus get up and walk and the man gets up and walk and it blows my mind y'all because the same disciples a little bit earlier in the Gospels uh, they came across a man who asked them to heal and the man they could not do the healing and Jesus came along Long, and Jesus said you couldn't heal why could you not heal and the disciples weren't able to but after a while when they started following Jesus they were able to heal I've learned these things about life y'all let me tell you something I can't do what God wants me to do until I give myself completely to Christ Jesus I can't play church and expect God to let me be the leader I have to be but when I'm able to give myself over mind body and soul and wallet to the Lord come on somebody then I'm able to understand and know that that when I follow Jesus, whatever he says he's going to do is already done. Whatever he said will happen is already happened. And I let folk know, when you follow me, don't look to me for leadership. Look to Jesus because I'm looking to Jesus. If you're following somebody else, don't look to them. Look to Jesus if they're following Jesus. And our ability to lead is based upon who we follow. Let us stand. I'm going to share something with y'all. Let us stand. I've, I've, I've. You, you, you go through certain things, you deal with certain things, and and been at this church a long time, had ups and downs, had rocky roads, bumpy things, good, bad, and indifferent, had days that I knew were good, days that I knew were bad, days where I couldn't tell heads from tails. Had folk tell me, um, I, ain't, I ain't never going to follow you nowhere you go, because I just ain't. It bothers you sometimes when you hear that, but I come to the understanding, and, and Jesus taught me this over time, over time, over time. Ain't nobody supposed to be following me. Yeah, I do lead you. I'm the pastor. I'm the leader. Yeah, I lead you. But understand, I only lead you where Jesus tells me to lead you. And you ought only follow those who you know are following Jesus. And if you are one who is a leader, and you are a leader, and you're following Jesus, Everybody who's behind you ought to know you're following Jesus. And everybody who's behind them ought to know they're following Jesus. So as the disciples were able to go out into the world, they were able to take a small movement and turn it into a worldwide phenomenon. They were able to come across a young man named Saul of Tarsus who ain't have Jesus nowhere on his heart. But as he began to follow Jesus, as others began to follow Jesus, he left from being Saul and he became Paul, one who was one of the foundational leaders in the movement for Christ Jesus. Lead by who you follow. So the question I have for you today is this, who are you following? Um, hurts my heart and pains my heart to see folk sing in the choir because they like the director. And when they don't, they don't no more. I, I don't, I like working in ministry when I like who's over the ministry. If I don't like who's over the ministry, I can't work in the ministry. I, I, if I'm not over the ministry, I don't want to work in the ministry. You don't know how many people I've had come to me and say, Reverend, I would be in this, but if I can't lead it, you're going to get somebody else to do it. it. Pains me, hurts me, but what it leads me to believe is just where we are. When I follow Jesus, I understand what my lane is. I understand how to get in where I fit in. And I understand it's really not all about me, but about he who is in me and about he who I follow. And no matter what anybody else says to you or about you, if you're following Jesus, you are an effective leader. So here's where we are, church. Here's where we are. If you got anything One of the things that's of the utmost importance is everybody needs to have a church home period. 
it is important to have a church home. It's a place where you can go to recharge and to refresh and to be rejuvenated, to just get filled up.